So today I wanted to talk a bit about childbirth and its role in pelvic floor dysfunction. So there's many contributing factors to why somebody might have problems with their pelvic floor. Um, so a lot of women who've never had children may have some issues. Teenage girls can have issues. Men can have issues. Um, there can be quite a few um, factors that were maybe going on for a woman um, before she had children and then maybe childbirth can be the triggering factor so um, things like um, you know how we breathe how we stand and move like our posture and alignment um, um, our, our hormones and um, there can be lots and lots of factors that all contribute to why one person might have some pelvic floor issues and another person doesn't but I think to ignore um, childbirth as one of the contributing factors would be wrong because for quite a few women it might be that they had some of these factors that perhaps made them more vulnerable to having pelvic floor issues but actually um, perhaps childbirth acted as the trigger that then kind of pushed them over into the realm of getting some pelvic floor symptoms whereas maybe before that point um, you know they might have like I said had some perhaps predisposing factors but they weren't getting any symptoms so I don't feel that birth necessarily has to be um, a factor that puts you more at risk of having pelvic floor issues and that's the main thing that I'm going to be discussing and talking about today and um, how we can perhaps try and make more informed decisions about um, childbirth in order to, to you know, lower some of the risks of having problems after having a baby. So birth is a natural process, our bodies are designed to give birth um, and actually I would argue that in a lot of cases it's the interference with that natural process that actually causes a lot of the problems. So you can read up quite a lot about this kind of a cascade of interventions where um, you know kind of one intervention then leads to more problems that then requires further interventions to try and rectify that. So if we go through in terms of with birth to start with, what are some of the known um, risk factors um, in a birth for having problems with your pelvic floor um, kind of following, following birth and delivery? So the first one would be a prolonged second stage of labour. So the second stage of labour uh, for people who, who might not know is what in our culture we tend to class as the pushing stage. Now we'll get into in a little bit later why maybe terming it as the pushing stage isn't necessarily um, always correct. Um, another risk factor would be if somebody was to have an episiotomy, um, so an incision, a cut to allow the baby to exit, or if they were to have um, a tear and now we're, we're talking really about more substantial um, tears so kind of you know second third um, fourth degree tears um, so a small tear probably wouldn't put you at a higher risk. Um, forceps deliveries um, and then in in some cases it might be that a very fast and rapid delivery of the baby could you put you at more risk because your body hasn't quite had time to adjust and you more, might be more likely then to get some of those um, tears that we've just spoken about. Um, now I just want to make it clear that in what I'm talking about I am talking about healthy women that you know is the majority of pregnant women so I'm not really talking and discussing about um you know, women who might have other issues going on during pregnancy, such as gestational diabetes or um, hypertension or um, other issues that may um, be complicating factors. I'm, I'm talking about women who are healthy, um, kind of both pre and during pregnancy. Um, and I think in those women, it's been estimated um that you know that there perhaps are some unexpected problems and maybe about four to five percent of those women if they were in an environment where they were completely 
undisturbed. Once you start adding in disturbance and interference, then actually um, like 60% of maternal morbidity is caused by those interferences rather than by, by there actually being some, some real problem going on. Um, so kind of unnecessary interference that we tend to get in our westernised culture. So if we take each of those risk factors in turn, and I just want to discuss a bit, again, not necessarily in every case, but in the majority of case, how most of these risk factors in terms of birth um, experience are actually probably avoidable. So if we take the first one to begin with, because that's going to be probably the biggest topic, so a prolonged second stage of labour. Um, so a prolonged second stage of labour, I think I think it's kind of between like an hour to two hours and over. Certainly kind of two hours and over would definitely be classed as a prolonged second stage of labour. So some of the reasons why somebody might have a prolonged second stage of labour. So the first one is I think the position that the woman is in. So in again in our culture and what tends to be portrayed in the media is a woman lying um, on her back to give birth. Now this is probably one of the worst positions that you can give birth in. Um, and I've got a model of the pelvis here which can just help to demonstrate a little bit more um, why this is not an optimal position. Um, so here's the back of your pelvis, here's your sacrum bone, so like the bottom of your spine and um, going into your coccyx bone. Uh, this model has actually got the pelvic floor on as well. But so if you imagine if a woman is lying on her back, then you can see here just underneath the sacrum bone kind of curls up. And then you can imagine if you're trying to push a baby out, you're actually almost pushing uphill. So not only are you not using gravity to help you, but actually, you know, it's the opposite. You're having to push up against gravity um, and it doesn't help with that pelvic outlet for allowing the baby to, to exit the pelvis. So, again, there might be quite a few reasons why somebody might not be in an optimal position. So again, certain interventions may mean that the woman's not in an optimal position. So if she's had quite a lot of um, pain medication during the labour, especially obviously if she's had an epidural, then she won't be able to be um, in a more kind of active position. Um, it's often easier for the birth attendant. So the birth attendant um, may encourage a woman to lie on her back um, because it's easier for them to be able to see what's going on and it's perhaps a, an easier position for them to be in. Um, if somebody's having continuous fetal monitoring, then they might be hooked up to all sorts of devices so that they can't really get up. So they have to be lying on the bed um, and then that can restrict their movement quite a bit. Um, so another reason why somebody might have a prolonged second stage of labour would be perhaps if they've had a long kind of and or stressful build up to that point um, and again there might be reasons why that might be so for example if somebody's had an induction um, then labour tends to be um, builds up a lot faster, your body hasn't had a chance to adjust to it, it can be a lot more painful. Your body's not actually ready to give birth at that point because it hasn't naturally um, gone into labour by itself, so your hormones are, are not kind of optimal. You're getting a synthetic version of the hormone oxytocin to kind of start the labour, or there might be other ways that labour has perhaps been induced, but, but whatever, however labour is induced, your body hasn't been what's triggered it. There's been outside factors that have triggered it. Your baby, again, perhaps wasn't quite ready at that point, so may have not moved into the most optimal position. So this, again, might make the second stage of labour a lot longer. Um, and again, if you've had a very stressful or a very long build-up to labour, um, to the second stage of labour, then... You, you know, you might be really exhausted by that point, um, 
stress um, interferes with the hormones that we should be naturally getting when we're in labour. So ideally we're wanting oxytocin so that really kind of feel good relaxing hormone and instead if you're under stress you're probably getting cortisol so your stress hormone and adrenaline kind of that fight or flight response and that tends to slow down your contractions so by the time you're actually dilated maybe you're not really getting kind of contractions as regularly as you need in that stage but you might be being encouraged to to push anyway um so that takes me on to the next point in terms of pushing so i said it might not always be correct actually to term the second stage of labor as the pushing stage um, because there's some, something known as the um, fetal ejection reflex um, which michael odin talks um a fair bit about um, and this is where actually the, the, your body in the right environment and situation and position will naturally um, expel the baby without you necessarily having to push. So in environments where it's nice and dark, it's calm, it's peaceful. So, you know, a lot of the reasons why women might go into labour, you know, um, at night time. So in that kind of environment... Um, where you've got that oxytocin, you haven't got bright lights, you haven't got interference, you haven't got people um, doing vaginal examinations and um, or telling you when to push, etc. Um, your body will still naturally give birth to that baby. And some women might not have the urge to need to push. Some women might just push kind of very, very gently just to help that process along. Um, but unfortunately, the fetal ejection reflex isn't really seen a lot, again, in our westernised culture because the interferences that tend to go on will prevent that from happening anyway. And a woman's often been instructed to push before her body would get a chance to, to do that anyway. Um, so, again, if we, if we go back to... Um, how we want our bodies to be um, during labour we want to be in a like a parasympathetic state so if you think of your nervous system you've got um, your parasympathetic state which is like your calm relaxed state and your sympathetic um, nervous system which is kind of you know more your um, state kind of action and um, can can be linked to your fight and flight response and things like that um, so this, some of this comes from, um, um, the book, um, Childbirth Without Fear by Grantley Dick Reed. Um, and I think it's an excellent book, so I'd really recommend reading that. And obviously he'll be, you know, then you'll have a much more detailed picture of it. But I'm just going to sum up some of the points, um, that he mentions in terms of his book, um, in terms of, of, um, Again, so the sympathetic nervous system that inhibits that um, expulsion um, because um, it's the parasympathetic um, nervous system that allows the uterine muscles um, to contract. And then the sympathetic nervous system also causes certain muscle fibres that um, that are surround in the middle layer of the uterus that surround the large blood vessels um, to constrict those blood vessels and obviously when you're giving birth you want optimal blood supply to the uterus so that again causes issues. He talks about like the harmony of the uterine muscle fibres so you've got the longitudinal muscle fibres um, which contract to cause that expulsion of the, the baby um, and then you've got the circular muscle fibres that are um, supposed to be nice and relaxed to allow that dilation um, so that the baby can, can come out the outlet of the womb. So I think maybe using your, um, thinking about your arm muscles, your bicep and your tricep muscles as an example. So when I bend at the elbow, my bicep muscles should be working to do that movement and my tricep muscles need to be relaxing and lengthening to allow that to happen. Now, if both 
sets of muscles are contracting then they're not working in harmony together I'm going to get tension I might get some some pain and that process just isn't going to be as efficient um, and the same can be thought of in terms of those longitudinal muscle fibres and the circular muscle fibres. So he talks about um, what he describes as the fear, tension, pain um, cycle. And I think in our culture, again, we're conditioned to be fearful of childbirth. Again, the, the, the media portray childbirth as a scary event childbirth and you know pregnancy in itself is very medicalized in our culture and um, so there's a lot of kind of looking for you know problems um you know there's a lot of emphasis on on things that could go wrong um in our culture it's the norm to give birth in hospital some people obviously do give birth at home but even that um, I'll discuss later how I feel that even at home it can become quite medicalised but um, but yeah even giving birth at home isn't necessarily seen as the, the norm within our culture. So that in itself if we're expecting something to be painful then it can become a self-fulfilling prophecy that it is painful and then obviously all the interventions and the situation and the environment can again further heighten that fear. Um, and then that causes the sympathetic system, nervous system, to be more dominant over the parasympathetic nervous system, which then causes some of the, the fight between those muscle fibres that we've just, just described. Again, like that analogy of your biceps and tricep muscle and that tension and kind of fight between those. Um, and then again, the restriction of the, the blood vessels, which makes... Um, the uterus less efficient if it's not got that blood supply that it needs um, and these things can then cause um, cause pain so um, within my profession within physiotherapy there's quite a lot of emphasis on um, pain science in terms of um, certainly in terms of all types of pain but certainly in relation to like um, chronic back and neck pain um, and I've just seen such a correlation between between this and between um, childbirth as well. So if you want to look into this a little bit further, um, painad.com um, have got some really good videos that you can watch that explains about this. And again, hopefully you'll see that the videos tend to be more obviously focusing on pain within like physiotherapy type settings. Um, but there's a real correlation, I think. So again, the more... Um, technical we've become so in terms of like with lower back we tend to do you know do a lot more scans MRI scans investigations um, and again if you're looking for something then sometimes it will it will show things but not things that maybe aren't actually related to that person's pain but they can up the pain because then suddenly they're worried about the findings and um, there's obviously a much higher use of opioids now than they used to be and actually this is not um helping tackle chronic pain if anything well chronic pain has increased and it's becoming more disabling so um and again you know the link between kind of stress and anxiety and how that can contribute to to pain so um Lorma Mosley, Peter O'Sullivan, Kieran O'Sullivan they're all really um really really good physios within the area of pain science that I definitely recommend kind of having a read about if you need that area and um, if you're not then hopefully you'll again be able to see the correlation between childbirth and between um kind of you know the pain science um so have a look at that um right so obviously we spent quite a long time talking about the the first risk factor so the prolonged second stage of labor the other the other factors i'm going to discuss a lot more briefly and um, because i think a lot of the points we've already discussed come into play there so um the other one was um like tears and episiotomies so again most of it's things that we've already covered so it could be if the woman's not in an optimal position, 
she might be more likely to tear if she's encouraged to push really hard then she might be more likely to tear because perhaps her body isn't ready or again she's not in an optimal position to allow the baby to come out easily um um again interfering so if you your uterus muscle isn't perhaps working as efficiently as it could do due to again some interference that is causing um, pain and anxiety and de decreasing your, your oxytocin levels um, if you've been induced and again like we said your body is not really ready to go into labour your baby might not be in the most optimal position um, I think the position of the baby sometimes that might be linked to factors that have been going on before going into delivery um, so, for example, our lifestyle where we tend to do a lot of sitting and especially if you do a lot of kind of slouch sitting where, again, if you think back to your, your pelvic position, if you're kind of slouch sitting, you're sitting on your sacrum, so your, sac um, so your pelvis is tipped back and that can affect the position that the baby tends to get into. Um, but there's a lot more about this on um, spinning babies. That's quite a good site to have a look into. Um, but sometimes there can be reasons why a baby might be in a certain position. Sometimes, sometimes it's unavoidable. But um, you know, even if even if a baby was in a breech position, um, depending on the type of breech position, it might you know it, it's it's still more than possible to have a vaginal birth that can be straightforward again if you don't have that interference with it. Um, and then the last. Oh, oh, and then forceps. I think forceps really kind of talks for itself. If you have a forceps delivery, there's probably been a lot of interference that has led up to that point. Um, or again, you know, induction, you might be more likely to have a forceps delivery. If you've had an epidural, you might be more likely to have a forceps delivery. Um, if you have a forceps delivery, there's more chance of nerve damage, which can then affect your pelvic floor. Um, so... I think I think things we've already discussed are again perhaps ways to try and decrease the risk of a forceps delivery. Um, the final point then was if you had a very fast or rapid labour. Um, now again, it might be that that the mother instinctively wants to go into positions perhaps to slow labour down in these cases. So your body might be telling you to get into a position actually just to start to slow things down a little bit more. Um, but maybe you don't have the freedom to do that depending on the setting that you're in or if you've got a lot of people around you instructing you what to do or you're being instructed to push um, and then maybe actually the baby comes out too quickly and, and sometimes you just need that time, your body needs that time. Um, I mean, I think uh, the rapid delivery, the reason that that might make you more prone to uh, pelvic floor issues like we've discussed you might be more likely to tear if things happen very very quickly and your body hasn't quite had chance to adjust to it um but actually um i think a lot of people might have a very quick delivery and and they might be fine they might not have issues with that um and then you know sometimes it can just be that you 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 your uterus muscle is actually really efficient at the process and that's why things happen so quickly so that one doesn't always have to be a negative one it's not necessarily due to kind of interference um so we've gone through we've gone through each of those um in turn um so it just brings me up to kind of the summary now. So I think knowledge is power. So make, trying to make sure that you're actually making informed birth choices. Sometimes we can feel so, um, you know, like these are our choices. And yet actually there might be a much wider range of choices than you initially thought. And um, it's your baby, it's your body, it is your choice. Um, so I think going into it, you know what that's not to say that there's a right or wrong decision to be made you have to make the choice that's right for you and your baby um, but I think often maybe women don't make fully informed choices in terms of this I know that I didn't in terms of the birth of my first daughter um, which again brings me you know with that in mind brings me to the next point of don't always assume that somebody else knows best which 
we can kind of get that white coat syndrome and assume all you know that the the midwives or the doctors must know something that I don't that's that must be the reason that they're telling me to lie on my back or um that must be the reason that that they're saying um you know whatever the situation is um and yeah actually sometimes afterwards you realize that that no if you'd have listened to your body um you know you know your body better than anybody else you're the one going through labor nobody should be telling you you kind of when to push because if you you know if you haven't had things like an epidural then actually you know you should be listening to your body and your instincts will tell you um when to do um what's right for you um don't always assume that if you've chosen to have a home birth that you're going to be protected from some of the interference so my um daughter she was a home birth and it's still the whole thing became very stressful very medicalized um i was instructed to lie on my back i was instructed to push you know so it doesn't necessarily protect you from those factors so you do really need to think things through i think you know the environment i think it can be easier perhaps to have the environment you want in a home setting but some some people might have hospital births that are actually kind of really peaceful really relaxed it's perhaps harder sometimes because it perhaps depends on your care provider um, and the hospital that you're with um whereas somebody else might have a home birth and like in my experience actually you know I had no choice over which midwife I had. It was just the on-call midwife who I'd only met once before. Um, and I think she didn't particularly want to be there. It was all very kind of like trying to rush the process along and um, for me to be in a position that was more optimal for her. Um, and then even once the baby was born, you know, things like we were dressing the baby too slow, so she had to do it. They took the baby away very quickly to do their checks and things like that. So a home birth doesn't necessarily protect you against some of those things. So really thinking about what you what you want, and I think not being too trusting. I think I I just thought, well, if you know, if as a physio I was educated about like birth position, then midwives are really educated about it, and it's kind of you know a real big thing now to try and encourage an active labour. And yet that wasn't kind of my experience with the midwives that I had. Um, and again, you know, like we said at the start of the podcast, if you're a healthy, if you're a healthy woman and you've had a healthy pregnancy, then actually birth isn't, um, isn't a medical, um, event. So, um, I really recommend, um, the Indie Birth website and they've got some really good informative podcasts that you can listen to, um, and just some really good resources, um, and, I'm I'm now 36 weeks pregnant with my second baby so I'm hoping to do another um, video once I've had this baby to um, hopefully give quite a positive birth story and I'll go through some more of kind of the resources and things that that I've been looking at at the moment to try and help me prepare and again make informed decisions in terms of that okay so thank you very much for listening